Hey, this is Matt once again. Welcome back to another video. This is like the third time I'm trying to record this. But it's 11 p.m. at night. It's cold out. There's 20 mile per hour winds. Uh, the light flickered, so I didn't know if we were going to lose power or it's just the light bulb. So now I'm paranoid. Just all sorts of stuff going on. Um, but if this does work, thanks for watching. Uh, and this is for Johnny, who sent in a paid request for, for me to do a commentary on the 1997 comedy Liar Liar. And if you're, anyone is interested in sending in a paid request, I will try to get to it as soon as I can. You just send it either directly to my PayPal or join my Patreon. Both links are down below in the info box, which is under the video. Uh, both of those links, and it could be for review, a commentary, a topic, a reaction. It could be random. It could be out of the blue. It could be I could talk about something I've talked about in the past. A re-review of a film. Now that this camcorder, at least the audio won't skip, like my webcam would do, and just every like five minutes be like, oh, that little piece froze, or that little piece, you know, camcorder doesn't do that, which is nice. <laughs> but I'm pretty open-minded for the most part uh, feel free now let's get right into it thanks once again Johnny um, pause at the beginning count down three two one pressing play and for syncing just a little bit here we got the Universal Pictures logo slowly wrapping around the earth this isn't the 75th anniversary, is it? No. That would have been years before. MCA Company, Fade Out. Then we have our second company logo. Here's the drip coming down onto a lady's face. No, just kidding. I think this is Ron Howard's company, Imagine. Uh, wavy, and then Imagine Entertainment. Again, this is for syncing. Fade Out. Then we have Universal Pictures and Imagine Entertainment, Fade Out, Brian Grazer Production, Fade Out, Tom Shady at Film, okay, sinking. But yeah, Tom Shady at, this is a guy who worked with Jim Carrey on Ace Ventura Pet Detective and worked with him on this and I think on Bruce Almighty. Now I know Tom Shady at, he had some type of accident. And it really screwed with his head. I forget the details, but I think he did a documentary on himself called I Am. And it just made me feel really sad. I mean, I can't remember the exact circumstances, but if you look him up, it's, it's interesting, but it's just very sad to hear what happened. Now, this is considered one of Jim Terry's best films, understandably so. Easily, I thought a lot of people put this in the top five. Uh, I mean, it's a simple concept that works. Oh, this bald guy here is Randall Tetz Cobb, who's in a personal favorite of mine, Uncommon Valor, and he was in Ace Ventura Pet Detective. He was the guy who Jim Terry took the dog from at the beginning of the film, and Jim Terry said, assholes may appear clo are closer than they appear. And he's the angry guy beating up Jim Terry's car at the beginning of the film. That's Randall Tetz Cobb. But yeah, I remember him from this film called Uncommon Valor. Apparently there's more scenes of him. I'm sure it's a scene showcasing Jim Carrey, how he is as a lawyer, how much he lies. But I guess they really wanted to get into the, the family dynamic front and center, which is understandable. And you can tell some other scenes were cut out, because this is a very short film. And flipping through it to make sure it works... You know, the movie works, so I want to, like, stop in the middle and freeze. I forgot this is a short film. I mean, by the time it gets to the end credits, it's like an hour and 20 minutes. Boom. Done. Now, this thing with the claw, apparently Jim Carrey, his dad used to do that to him when he was a kid. And I think Jim Carrey, one of the reasons he liked doing this film was because he got to play just a normal guy. He wasn't the mask, he wasn't the Riddler, he wasn't a pet detective, it was just a father. Now of course by this time, him and her had split up, 
and Jim Terry, as a lawyer, lies all the time. And it's just, like I said, it's a simple concept, but what if a lawyer could not lie for an entire day? I mean, it's... Makes you wonder why that concept wasn't done before in, a, in an 80s comedy. Richard Pryor, that would have been funny. Can you imagine Richard Pryor as a lawyer that bullshits his way around, and then he has to tell the truth for an entire day? Fuck you talking about, you know, <laughs> R-rated, but... And so as a lawyer, he's very prim and proper, but he's bullshitting, but then when he has to tell the truth, he just, even more, that'd be cool. Also, it's nice that Jim Terry references... Didn't he reference, like, Macho Man Randy Savage here? Like, wrestling? But there's Terry Elwes. From The Princess Bride, Robin Hood Men in Tights, who plays his ex's new hubby, boyfriend. And Terry Elwes, he does a nice job because he's not really a bad guy. And that's an interesting choice. They didn't make Terry Elwes like a bad guy or an awful guy. It's just... He seems like a good husband. Well, he's not a husband yet, but... He seems like a good boyfriend. Treats him well. He treats the kid well. <laughs> so you get the idea Jim Terry's character was cheating on her. That's the thing, when you look at this, these attributes, he's not really the best guy, this character. He lies to his kid, he cheated on his wife, and that's kind of the thing is that this is a guy that's made humble throughout this day. And that's kind of the point is that he learns to be a better person. But yeah, I know this, this definitely had some deleted material. I think even in the trailer there's some deleted scenes that you see in the trailer. And then, again... They uh, they cut it out here, which is probably why it was such a short film. But yeah, this came out in 1997, and that was a year where you had Jurassic Park 2, you had Air Force 1, as good as it gets, and then in December, Titanic, which of course became the biggest film of its time. But here we're setting up all the little cues that Jim Terry's lying about. And of course, when, he, when the switch flips, you just you tell all the details that they're going to get into. Like the girl with the crazy hair, the guy who's overweight, the homeless guy before that, doesn't remember his name, this guy with the... Now, by this time, Jim Carrey, he was on such a huge streak of successes. I mean, after In Living Color, he had Ace Ventura Pet Detective, which did it very well. Which is my favorite. I know it's weird, because he had been in films before, like the vampire film he was in, Once Bitten, and others, but Ace Ventura Pet Detective really got his uh, box office success going to the stratosphere. And then you had the mask, you had Dumb and Dumber. That was all in 94. Then 95 you had Batman Forever, which was a huge hit. So it seemed like he could do anything. So he did the table guy, which he got 20 million, and that became the first like disappointment of his career. It didn't do well at all. Jim Terry's very proud of it because it's like the only film he's done a commentary for. 
and he did with Ben Stiller and Judd Apatow, because Judd Apatow helped write it, and Ben Stiller directed it. Again, the Table Dry Blu-ray. It's pretty fun commentary. So, after the Cable Guy kind of went, I think Jim Carrey felt, okay, I definitely need something to bring my box office level up. And this did that. I think people thought, oh, is Jim Carrey going to recover? And he recovered well with this. This was a big hit. It was in the top 10 biggest films of 1997. Number 8 or number 7, somewhere around there. And I'm trying to think, I'm trying to think what uh what else came out? What was after that for Jim Terry? Because ninety nine was me myself and Irene, which was a fun film and that did pretty decent business. And yeah, of course, this is going to the workaholic dad. We've seen that troll plenty, plenty of times. The dad is a workaholic who doesn't have time for his son. I mean, you you did name like half a dozen Eddie Murphy films that did that. Imagine that. Workaholic dad. You have... Uh, what was that? Uh, the Disney ride. Haunted Mansion. He was a workaholic dad. I think... Uh, a thousand words. Workaholic dad. Daddy Day Camp. No, Day Tear. Daddy Day Tear, which I actually don't mind that film. But he was a. It was a workaholic dad, but it was done well. Just like here, I think he's done fairly well. It is a common trope. It does seem like, okay, we, we've seen this all done before. But you do have stuff done before as in the execution. Like here, it's Jim Terry's manic performance. His energy. Like when he beats the shit out of himself. And all the stuff that happens in between then. And the, the fast pacing. It definitely helps in that manner. And he is nice to his son. That's the thing. Like He treats his son well when he's there. Like this where he's playing... Around with this kid, and you know, what are you, 21, 22? Like, he works well with the kid. Uh, the kid does a fine job acting, being innocent as a kid. I don't know what this kid went on to do. <laughs> and he works well as a, as a father figure. I think Jim Carrey definitely took this to the heart because, again, it was kind of another growth in his evolution where a little bit more... It is a little bit more of a serious... I mean, it's comedy. Yeah, a lot of goofiness. But you still have seriousness with him and the kid and realizing he's a bad father... Like, when he has to tell the truth, he's, he says that, and it's kind of a being soaked in cold water sensation. And there's a kid, like, being once again disappointed, just tired of the guy saying he'll do something, he doesn't do it. What does Jim Terry say here? It's like, he struck the child. You see that? He struck the child. <laughs> and Terry Ellis, just how earnestly sweet Terry Ellis is playing this. Date's dead. Date, you're welcome, son. <laughs> Let me grab a little drink here. Of 
course he doesn't make the birthday party and that's when the wish happens now granted yeah you get into the whole why does it happen what kind of magic does this happen you either go with it or you don't some people may get mad well there's no actual explanation as to how this magic happens and yeah I just went along with it I remember reading somewhere that apparently Big with Tom Haynes was kind of an inspiration as well but here's uh, Jennifer Tilly which is a role I could deal with her because she's in small portions and she's supposed to be you know, a person we don't like <laughs> so uh, to me it fits Jennifer Tilly well it's a lady who had a lot of affairs and you find out at the end the kids want to be with their dad more than her with just into the end I do wonder what happened with Jim Carrey job-wise. I think it says a year later, he seems to be doing well job-wise. Wear a nice suit. Does he go be a lawyer somewhere else? Does he get another job? Did Jeff Tilly get to keep the kids? Did, he, did she not keep the kids? That never really comes to any further development. The movie kind of drops that. I mean, Jim Carrey complains about it, but the idea, there's not really any follow-up to that. I just like, well, the movie's more about this family, Jim Carrey learning his lesson, and perhaps him and the ex getting back together. But it never goes into the job circuit. I'm sorry, just the fact he's like Tina Turner mentioned Beyond Thunderdome. I think Jennifer Tilly once said that it was like an honor to work with Jim Carrey. But he's definitely a guy that has a... I mean, at the end of this film, there's outtapes and how he'll do certain scenes different and there's a little bit of ad-libbing, a little bit of freedom to that. As well as some stuff to stick with the script. I mean, at the end of the day, to like the film is because number one, it's a fun concept that I think they did a pretty decent job fully capitalizing on it. And number two, Jim Terry's manic energy that uh, he was fit for perfectly in this realm, in this time frame of his career. And it sat there for a while. God, this is such a depressing birthday. Why would you be happy with this fucking clown that barely has makeup on his face? Happy? Happy what, that you don't jump out the fucking window? Uh, because the birthday cake there is a baseball field, further showcasing that the kid is a fan of baseball. I thought they did a decent job with the ex-wife. They didn't make her too bitchy. Where she sees, she's fairly understanding that, you know, she realizes her son likes his father and that when he does come over, he treats the son very well and, like, does this claw thing <laughs> that she's trying to mimic. And she's understanding. And when, you know, again, the father doesn't come to his own son's fucking birthday party, then. I can understand her decision making. And right here when she finds this out, you understand her anger, we understand her frustration, and we did it. And we did why she's like, well, screw it. We're going to leave and if you keep doing this, I'm not going to let my son get disappointed, 
filter into his fucking psyche more and more. So it makes sense. Again, sometimes they do these films and they do a not as good of a job, so sh they come off as more bitchy than they should or more unlikable than they should. But no, the her point of view makes perfect sense in this instance. And you know, to see how crushed the son is that his, his dad isn't there. I think that really clinches the, the mom character to be like, you know what, we're going to move. And again, there might be no explanation to the magic, but again, you just go with it or you don't. And that happens with a lot of, you know, Twilight Zone episodes. I think someone mentioned this is similar to a Twilight Zone episode where someone owned a car, like a car dealership or something, and they couldn't lie for a day. I don't know if that's true. Maybe it was Twilight Zone. I can't, I can't remember. <laughs> but it's all he promised, blah, blah, blah. And the thing is, uh, after this, like with Jim Terry films, you know, I like me, myself, and Irene. But, I don't know. There were not a whole lot of Jim Terry films other than maybe... I liked Eternal Sunshine, The Spotless Mind. I liked his work in Sonic to the Hedgehog. It's cool that he's coming back for the sequel. But, I don't know. I didn't care about Philip Morris, whatever the hell it was called. The number 23 I didn't care for. The Truman Show was good. After, that came out after this. The Truman Show was really good. But I don't know, like, for the... Before Sonic, like, the... Quite a few of his last films, like, eh... Not really big on it, but... See, we're 20 minutes in, and we get to the... The big... Thrust, thrust of the plot. I've had better. <laughs> See... Idea yeah, that that's a fun concept. What if someone could not lie and all the crazy stuff you would get into? I've had better. <laughs> Sorry, I got some snacks, some peanut, uh, peanuts for the movie. <laughs> Fair, I want to stack on something. <laughs> Chris doesn't realize it yet, but it's going to get a lot. <laughs> I don't. I don't know if he could do this today because it'd be considered exploitation, exploiting her. But there are women who dress like that, and that's what. If you can only tell the truth, that's what they would fucking say. But, <laughs> but <laughs> I want to scream them. <laughs> Again, with the way he's able to maneuver his face and work his whole body into it. <coughs> yes, I could. I won't eat this too much because I don't want to, you know, annoy people with no, 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 no. <clears throat> yeah, just second thought that. It's like. Echo is done on the. At this point, the biggest case of his career. And how do you be it without being able to lie? <laughs> and the reason I think Jim Terry was best for this role is because you have to spit it out but then 
this realization that he did it not on purpose. So you have to have a guy that looks like he's fighting his own body. His own body is going to tell the truth, but his mind doesn't want to do it. <laughs> like here, it's like him trying to spit this truth out, but yet... Well, it's to spit this lie out. He, his mind wants to spit this lie out, but the body just won't let him. <laughs> I need to death him. <laughs> and this is like his mind giving up because his body just won't let him lie. <laughs> we'll play Hopple. Up <laughs> <laughs> and sorry that I don't have a lot of behind the scenes stuff to talk about this because I mean it does have quote a special edition but I don't know the features didn't seem like it featured much which is it's always crazy to me how certain films just don't have as many features as you think they should let alone the variety of films that have nothing, not even a Blu-ray itself. <laughs> this is ridiculous. Well, you think about Ace Ventura Pet Detective, that really doesn't have much of a special edition, which is ridiculous. Of course here, I can't lie. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I've seen this film quite a few times on VHS. And uh, it's a little bit different from the theatrical posters of VHS. The VHS is more of a close-up shot of Jim Carrey. I think his hands are like this. Like, trust me. While the poster, he's got like his arms wide up. And... <clears throat> <laughs> uh, the reveal of his hair. <laughs> and the thing is that a good chunk of this is kind of a few use of sets. Like this courtroom is used for a lot of it. There's the bathroom. There's his office. I'm sure this had a decent budget because... Because this is a fart joke, but it's not as bad because we didn't hear... Number one, we didn't have the sound. Here's the thing with the hair. And here's the setup and now the punchline. The hair. What's up? Your cholesterol. You're not poor enough to remember. <laughs> See, again, it's, it's like Tourette's. It's like a certain form of Tourette's where it says it, but then he... He can't stop it. <clears throat> to, be, to be able to control your body like that is a lot harder than may, maybe one would think. I mean, this whole bit here is one of my favorite bits with the with the blue pen. But, like, try and do this. This and the bathroom scene are, like, two prime examples of, again, the usage of the body. Is... <laughs> He, just, he can't say red. The most he just say is royal blue. <laughs> and it explains like, can he write it? Nope. <laughs> And then, then you get to the punchline. The pen is blue. The goddamn pen is blue. <laughs> Again, this is the end to his, his uh, usage of his own body.
like you, you would see a little bit like Bruce Campbell doing this before and like Evil Dead 2 when he battles his hand. <laughs> I mean, that's what I mean. It's his body versus his own mind. And, you know, other than, you know, Bruce Campbell, which he did in Evil Dead 2, and Devin Sawa did in Idle Hands, this is like a comedic, even straight up comedy version of it. There is the pit is blue. The God. <laughs> And this lady, I know I've seen her before, but I can't remember what other movies they were. But it's like, I, I've seen her before in other stuff. <laughs> Let me just sit over here. <laughs> oh, I'm such a shit. <laughs> I did, I just... It's a very funny film. It would definitely be in my top five favorite Jim Carrey films. If I'm thinking, okay, what would be in my top ten? God, I'd, I'd have to see a, a list... My favorite is Ace Ventura Pet Detective. My second favorite... I have sex. <laughs> Just the way he says it, having sex. It's like a comedy version of an exorcism, almost. But listen, my favorite is Ace Ventura: Pet Detective. My second favorite, maybe Dumb and Dumber, the theatrical cut. Uh, Ace Ventura: When Nature Calls would be in my top five. I'd probably put Liar Liar. Maybe top three. I mean, this is a pretty funny film. I know this would be in my top. It may be number three. Like, watch it again. I'm getting a lot of good laughs out of it. No. Truman Show. The Truman Show I'd output number three. Because I do love The Truman Show. Because it's a fun film, but it's got a good heart. And I love the whole idea, the plot, the aesthetic. I, I do love The Truman Show. Um, and then... Yeah, Ace Ventura, Pet Detective... The... Uh, Dumb and Dumber, The Truman Show, then probably, it's between Liar Liar and Ace Ventura When Nature Calls, I'm not sure which I like more, I like both of them, they'd have to be in my top five, and then top ten, I know Eternal Sunshine of Spotless Mind, top ten, Sign the Hedgehog would be in the top ten, I really enjoyed it in his performance. Maybe the mask. I think the mask would be in the top ten. <laughs> Does he go like holy hell? Did he sees the girl he had sex with. <laughs> yep. Let's see, I wanted to look up Jim Terry's filmography while I'm doing this. And sorry if I'm seem a bit out of it. I'm still, like I said, I'm getting better with my health. I was still a little bit under the weather, but I'm getting a little bit better, thankfully. But I'm not 100% there. Yeah, he's speeding, then he's like, has to tell the top everything he did. <laughs> and people don't realize there's a lot of comedies that have some really decent stunt work in them. Um, you know, stunt work we think of with action films, but there's a lot of comedies you look at. You go, wow, the stunts in there are pretty damn solid. Like at the end here, when at whether you have a real airplane, and you have one of those, I forget what the the term is. 
but he, you know, the Jim Terry's character tastes, what is it called? Unpaid party tickets. Mobile mobile stairway. <clears throat> but yeah, looking through his filmography, he was a host in various roles in something called the Sex and Violence Family Hour. Some small bit in All in Good Taste and Finders Keepers. Once bitten, I think that was his first starring role. Honestly, I remember not being a big fan of the film. Peggy Sue got married. He had a supporting role in that. The Deadpool, he was the rock and roll guy singing Welcome to the Jungle while lip syncing it. He's one of the first to die from the villain. Earth Girls Are Easy, which I can never get into. Pink Cadillac, he was a lounge entertainer. High Strun, which I did see, which I did not mind. That's with uh, Steve Oderkirk as the lead. And Jim Terry has a bit role near the end as Death. <clears throat> but that was kind of a very small but fun film, High Strun. <clears throat> I hear you go. Know. You've been here before. <laughs> Again, even little things like he would just catch the keys, but the fact is like, let me do this to catch the keys. All these little things that add up to this manic fury energy that's uh, infectious. Be yeah, Ace Ventura, Ace Ventura, Petty Touch, The Mass, Dumb and Dumber, Batman Forever, Ace Ventura, When Nature Calls, All Hits, and then The Cable Guy didn't do that well. But then Liar Liar, The Truman Show, uh, Man on the Moon, yeah, it was there, and it didn't do well. And me, myself, and Irene, I liked that film. It did do decently. How the Grinch Stole Christmas, that did well at the box office. The Majestic was a flop. Wasn't a fan of the film. I thought it was way too long. I didn't care for the story. Just I thought it was a very boring story, in my opinion. Bruce Almighty was fun. I keep forgetting about Bruce Almighty. I don't think it's as good as Liar Liar, but again, that's kind of the workaholic guy who, here's the thing where he says he's a bad father, and again, it's like the body tells him, and then the mind now, like, wait a minute, it's like, again, water has been poured onto him. Again, like, she's not being bitchy. She's being reasonable, like, like, come on, man. Like, she's not being snooty or mean. It's like she wants this to work. And, again, that's a lot harder than people make it out to be in terms of writing and acting. Did you have credit to, oh, is her name Maura Tier? Wait, I want to hear her name right. Maura Tierney as Audrey. I do. She was in Primal Fear, Primary Colors, Forces of Nature, Insomnia, TV show ER. I think mainly the TV show ER. Yeah, for 180 some episodes is Dr. Abby Lockhart. Rescue Me, nine episodes. I think that was the Dennis Leary show. The Affair, The Good Wife, a few others.
Now, the judge, I was looking up the judges, I'm like, he looks familiar. His name is Jason Bernard. Jason Bernard was... He was the mayor in Blue Thunder. He was the cap, a captain in War Games. He was in the Star's Chamber as one of the judges. And this was the last film he was in, Sally. He passed away... He passed away... 1996. So this is October 1996. So that's too bad. I didn't know he had passed away. But yeah, he did a lot of TV work throughout the years. I mean, this idea of the guy who plays the judge. He was in episodes of Days of Our Lives, MASH, The Jeffersons, V. The Deuce of Hazard, Night Court, Fats of Life, Starman, which show that didn't last long, The Cosby Show, Beauty and the Beast, he was in an episode of that, Wise Guy, The Flash as Dr. Desmond Powell. Oh, I think that's where I recognize him from, The Flash TV Show, as Dr. Desmond Powell. I, mean, oh, I, I think that's where I recognize him from. He was also Captain William Elson in the video games Wing Commander 3 and 4. <clears throat> but yeah, Bruce Almighty, going back to Jim Terry, Bruce Almighty was a fun film. I mean, I, workaholic, like this one. I think this one, though, is a lot funnier. Bruce Almighty... I, did, I liked, I just didn't think it was as funny as this one. It was such a spotless spot. I saw that in the theater. Very well done. Romantic drama. Very creative. But after that, that's when it started losing me around 2004. Fun with Dick and Jane, I thought it was rather forgettable. Just my opinion. Number 23, I did not like at all. I, just, I like Joel Schumacher. I think that's one of his worst films. Yes, man. When I first saw it, I disliked it. I saw it again years later. I'm like, eh. Yes, man, I would call it mediocre. It's like they try to do this one where instead of forced to tell the truth, he makes the choice to say yes to everything. And it's like, uh, I don't know. I, just, I didn't think it was as funny as a comedy as maybe some other people did. I love you, Philip Morris. I did not care for it at all. Christmas Tarot, Lemony Snicket, I'm not a fan of those. Incredible Bird Wonderstone, I liked him. I wish he was the main character, but Sally's not. I, he, he was the best part of that. That was the, one of the films with uh, Steve Carell, I believe. I mean, I've seen worse films, but... Kick-Ass 2, Dumb and Dumber 2. Dumb and Dumber 2, I fucking hate. I hate Dumb and Dumber 2. And then... Dark Crimes, I did not see. But yeah, he's in Son of the Hedgehog 2. And then... Apparently there's a film on Dr. Seuss that there's talks about. And maybe Jim Terry played Dr. Seuss. And there's talks of another Ace Ventura film. In December 2019, it was reported a third film was in development. March... That's another one of my favorite bits. That's kind of the things I just want to say all the... I, not all the time. I want to say that in real life. Stop breaking the law, asshole! Because I remember when I first saw that. It, I just didn't think he would be that loud and angry. Because he's very mundane. It's like, Stop breaking the law, asshole! But yeah, apparently in uh, March 2021, Ace Ventura 3 was officially announced to be in development with Pat Casey and Josh Miller as co-screenwriters. Oh, these are the guys that worked on Sonic the Hedgehog. The project will be joint venture production with Warner Brothers and Morton Creek, Amazon, and Prime Video. 
On August 7, Jim Carrey confirmed he was more than ready for the next chapter. I don't know. I mean, Prime, Amazon Prime. The last sequel I saw from Amazon Prime was Coming to America 2. So, I'm like, I don't know. Do I want... Like, how old is Jim Carrey nowadays? Sorry, I'm just looking at... <clears throat> 60. You know, do I really want to see a 60-year-old... A 60-year-old Ace Ventura? I mean, I'm not sure if I... Not really. I mean, I hope it surprises me. I hope it does. But Dumb and Dumber 2, I did not like at all. The fucking Eddie Murphy with Amazon coming to America was awful. Again, I'm just not sure about about that, you know. I'm looking at something here at the at least domestic box office. Oh wait, this is the the story about his uh, assistant is leaving. I'm waiting to his Jim Tears reaction. Oh god Ted. I did just that reaction, like, this Tourette's, and it... <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at this, where... I know, I'm sorry, I'm just doing a little bit of research into something. I'm trying to see where Jim Terry is and the box office stars, like how much money their movies have made. I'm trying to look into it. Um, it shows domestically, but it doesn't show worldwide. So, I don't know where he is domestically, but... No, way. I... 55. 55, wow. And then, that's worldwide. Domestically, he's in 30, 31. Now, this is him shitting on the boss. And the boss is played by Mitchell Ryan. Which they'll cut to right about as they look at him here. Now, Mitchell Ryan, I remember him the most from Lethal Weapon. He was one of the main villains. Along with Gary Busey. Uh, he was the guy that Danny Glover goes, No way you live. No way. And shoots the car, and then the car hits the bus, and the, the car blows up with Mitchell Ryan in it. So. Was it. <laughs> and I'll just him on shitting on everybody. And maybe they're enjoying this just kind of like one of those roasts. Like if you look throughout the very years, you have the, the Friars roast. So they're kind of enjoying that fashion. Maybe they're laughing because the boss is laughing, but at the same time. <laughs> I 
the thing that made me laugh the most is when he just calls the other girl slut. <laughs> slut! <laughs> now, I don't, I, again, with how there were other deleted scenes, which, sadly, I'm not sure if they're on the, the Blu-ray, because I can't find my Blu-ray. Of Liar Liar. I know there's a new Blu-ray out, but I couldn't find my old Blu-ray of Liar Liar. So that's why I'm watching uh, this uh, version online. But, uh... <laughs> but, again, one of those things that's interesting, like, for top 100 stars at box office in the U.S., Jim Terry's at number 31, but worldwide he's at number... 55. Now, number 31 in domestic, you look at the people above them, and a lot of them is because of Marvel and Star Wars. Like, for example, Chadwick Boseman is at number 25 because he was in Avengers films, Captain America films, Civil War, and stuff. Say with Jeremy Renner, Don Cheadle, Mark Ruffalo, Chris Pratt, Chris Hemsworth, Chris Evans. Scarlett Johansson is number three. Robert Downey Jr. is number two. And yes, for those wondering, worldwide, Robert Downey Jr., is the number one box office star. Scarlett Johansson is number two, and Samuel Jackson is number three. But in the U.S., Samuel Jackson is number one. Now, of course, Robert Downey Jr. and Scarlett Johansson are so high up there, along with Chris Hemsworth and Chris Evans, because of the Marvel films. Going all the way back to Iron Man. With Robert Downey Jr., Iron Man 2, Scarlett Johansson was part of that, and more. The Avengers films... And the you know Thor has felt all that jazz. So the stuff that impresses me are people like you know, Tom Cruise. Well, that helps. That's helped by Mission Impossible. But Johnny Depp. That's helped by Pirates of the Caribbean. But like Eddie Murphy, you look at Eddie Murphy domestically, and it's like. Yeah, he had the Baby Hills Cop, but he didn't have, like, a lot of franchise, especially none on the Marvel front. Same with, you know, Adam Sandler. Or even, you know, Ben Stiller. I guess other than the Meet the Parents. <laughs> Let me go back to the film, more so, but... I didn't just him try and goes the water the <laughs> and let me look over here. Just check that everything's plugged in correctly. Cause I don't want this unplugged incorrectly. Again, he's just quite not quite sure what to do next. He's like, what did he do? <laughs> I mean, there's not much for him to do, honestly. <clears throat> and that's going to lead into the fight in the bathroom, which is definitely one of the points people bring up when they mention this movie. They mention, you know, him being the shower of him in the bathroom. What are you doing? I'm kicking my own ass. Do you mind? <laughs> and again, just how Jim Terry is able to use his body. And just how he's able to use this back and forth. Just how many actual bruises, how many actual shit he, had, he put himself through during the whole scene and sequence. And yeah, this was the time Jim Terry was getting paid $20 million. I mean, he first got that with the cable guy. Now, that was unheard of at after getting $20 million. He was the first guy to get $20 million. 
And it makes sense why the studio decided on him because 1994 and 95, it was like, no matter what happened, both Ace Ventura films, The Mask, Dumb and Dumber, like in two years, all five of your films were huge hits. That doesn't happen often. Maybe you're lucky you had one hit or two hits, but five in two years? That's like unheard of. Like all three of your films are a hit in one year? It's like, okay, we need to capitalize on this. And this is pretty violent. I mean, his nose is bleeding. Titty my own ass. Titty my ass. <laughs> I can imagine something under that wall. I wonder. Um, I'm guessing this is a set, but maybe it's a location. I don't know. But I'm guessing it's a set. And just what would have happened. Well, no, I mean, just. If it was a set, damn, we could bring the fucking whole thing down. He bashed it hard, too hard enough. <clears throat> of course, he's telling the truth, but he just doesn't name the name of his own volition. And I think I was bringing this up before. It is sad that you know before Sonic the Hedgehog. Again, there was this about ten year stretch where Jim Terry to me just wasn't doing anything worth a squat. And then personal personal stuff going on where he's acting weird he's going on talk shows acting as if he's some wannabe cult leader or he's got this thick beard he's talking about i'm not really here and i don't know what his deal is i don't know if as i know there was a bit where there was this girl ex-girlfriend he had who died and then someone tried to blame it on him oh he gave her an std but then it was found to be untrue or no, I don't know all the details, so I don't know for certain. If anyone knows all the details of like what was going on with his person, why why he was acting so weird in interviews, feel free to comment down below. I love to to read it. But yeah, I just I'm like, what the fuck is Jim Terry doing? Like, I remember when this guy used to be funny, and then even movie roles, like he did Kick Ass Two. Which he was in it for five minutes. Then his character gets killed off. Sorry for spoiling for spoils for people. Spoils to spoils. But then he's like, "Well, you know, this happened with the school shooting, so I denounce violence." I'm like, "Well, you cast the pay you cashed the paycheck, dude. You knew what it was going into it." Films have nothing to do with it. I mean, and then you want to say you don't want to make a film that's violent, but then didn't you also do that dark film, Dark Crimes? Didn't you do that after Kick Ass 2? Was that before? So I just. He saw something, it was a quick reaction. He should, he should have just kept his fucking mouth shut. Because it made him look bad. He's like, motherfucker. We gave you this money to be part of this film. The film is goofy or it's a shitty film anyway, Kicked Ass 2, I'm sorry. The first Kicked Ass I, I don't dislike as much as I used to, but the, the second Kicked Ass sucks. But I mean, this just nervous energy, this total 
wonderment of what the hell he's going to do next. And he just doesn't know. He doesn't know. And what's crazy is we only have... If you take out the end credits... We only have 22 minutes left of this film. And that includes you know, the minute two or two of an epilogue. That includes the whole airport sequence with the mobile stairway. All that jazz. So him, he has to <coughs> talk to a witness that he knows is lying, so he, <laughs> as if you guys don't know. <coughs> Again, when you look at the film, if it wasn't for Jim Terry's bid paycheck, this film should not have cost that much. Because again... You're outside a couple times, but for the most part, you've been in, again, either the offices, which is a couple sets, his office, the boss's office, uh, this courtroom, like I said, a few places outside, and then the, the kids' home. Like, it's not a lot of locations. Well, the airport sequence. Okay, <clears throat> to be fair, the, the sequence at the end at the airport. <clears throat> But other than that, there's not like a big special effects action, you know, spectacle, all that jazz. In this case, Jim Carrey is the special effect. And that's... Without him, this film would not work. <laughs> I did, like... The, the, did you <laughs> I did this, his physical comedy is it is prime in this this era you know these five years between 94 and 99 from Ace of Ventura Pet Detective to me myself and Irene that five years is his prime for the physical comedy Obviously, he's 60 years old. He can't do as much as he used to. And then when he tried, like, Dumb and Dumber 2, it was just more gross-out dads. Yes, there were gross-out dads. Yes, there were gross-out dads in Dumb and Dumber 1, but they amplify that in the sequel. Oh, people like that toilet scene, so let's have 15 scenes similar to that toilet scene. So, going up the old, old woman's cooch and his dust, and it's like, come on, man. And it does show that, you know, Jim Terry's uh, character is a decent lawyer. That he's able to win this case without lying. And, again, that's what makes me wonder if there were scenes filmed that wrapped up the job portion of the story. To the end, when he leaves, it seems like he's fired. He got put in jail. He probably got fired from this law firm. Who knows other people would take him. Would he be a lawyer still? If not, what other job did he do? Unless they mentioned the, at the very end, and I completely forgot. Like, does Jennifer Tilly, I did, does she still keep those kids or not? I mean, I don't know.
Now, in that scene, in the outtakes later on, the other lady says, over actor, as a, he told me to say that, he told me to say that. <laughs> So I'm now listening to the dialogue. Now, there have been other comedy... Now, there have been a lot of movies dealing with lawyer stuff, but... There was one before this, years ago, called My Cousin Vinny. And apparently, f f I understand, like, a lot of lawyers, they'll talk about scenes in courtrooms. Yeah, they that would not happen. That would not happen. But I, it, it seems like a lot of lawyers have said that My Cousin Vinny kind of... I don't know if it's like one of the best lawyer movies in a weird way. Like there, there have been a couple of videos online where lawyers like react to those scenes in, in these type of films, and my cousin Vinny's kind of put up on a higher, higher up. I wonder what they would think about this. I mean, this movie's been more for comedy and goofball than what a lawyer would actually do. <clears throat> but again, yeah, there have been other counties dealing with the lawyer circuit, the courtroom circuit, and I mean, my cousin Vinny being one of them, but Joe Pesci, Ralph Macchio, Ralph Macchio and his buddy are convicted of a crime. They did uh, Ralph Macchio, one of his relatives, who's Joe Pesci, at these two youths, what what's a youth? Yeah, these two youths. He try to say youths. Uh, I'm defending these two youths. <laughs> That's a fun movie, my cousin Vinny. A uh, very entertaining film. And here, Jim Carrey kind of realizes what kind of job he's in. Where Jim Vertilli wants to take the custody away from the dad, and the kids don't want that, and. Even though he won, he uh, grows a conscious. That's kind of what the symbolism here, he grows a conscious. And people, oh yeah, it's predictable, but, but, but Jim Terry sells it well. He's, his face is very expressive. See, that's why I'll, a lot of co comedians like this can do well with drama. Like, he did well in drama with the comedy in The Truman Show, which came out in 98, a year after this. He did it well in Eternal, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. He had this TV show, I guess, didn't do anything. I remember it being advertised, though, where he was the host of a kid show. Not Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, but, you know, that kind of kid's TV show, but it was, like, more dramatic. But, I guess it wasn't much you want to know about, because you heard no one talk about that show. I mean, they could do drama. They just need the right script. Like, the number 24, 24, 23, 25, 27, 20, 20, 20, just sucked. I mean, it was a late, fucking lame, predictable plot. What do you mean predictable? Fucking five minutes in, I knew what was up with Jim Terry's character. Just knew. Because I've seen these type of thrillers before. If he was 100% innocent, that'd be more shocking. The music, I will say, is a little bit schmaltzy with the musical score. I don't think they needed the score to be that schmaltzy. I, I think you could have played that whole thing without the score.
I mean, that's I would say that's one of the drawbacks of watching this again. I'm not a big fan of the score. I think the score... The musical score seems like it tries too hard. It tries too hard to be funny. Or it tries too hard to be schmaltzy. I mean, it's not one of the worst scores ever. Not by far. It's just... You know, if I'm looking for something that is a weak point, I think the musical score just... It telecrafts stuff too on the nose. Like, this is silly. And this is schmaltzy. And this is... This is where the emotions are coming. I guess it's not the worst, it's just... I mean, I've... Don't give all your money away. You probably want some for, I don't know, uh, a tab. <laughs> Unless he's going to really run all the way to the airport. You do have money for a tab, right? Or is your car still there? <laughs> and here Terry Elwes, I think he tries to do the car thing, uh, the claw. which just doesn't quite work out. <laughs> And this is like, Terry Owens, they didn't make him a villain, they didn't make him snidely whiplash, or he's a creep, or a dick. Because it would have made it easier to be like, oh yeah, you know, this guy's a creep, she should just go back to Jim Terry. But, the the fact that made him a decent guy makes it go, well, you know, the family will be well with him too. I did always like to see Terry Elwes. Again, uh, I enjoyed him from The Princess Bride to Robin Hood Men in Tights. He was in the first Saw film. And then, what was that? Was it Saw 7? He came back. The final chapter. And then there were two more after that. Again, any time a fucking movie says the final chapter, chapter is fucking horseshit. And here we get to our finale. And man, this went by fast. We only have like nine minutes left of the fucking film. I did. I remember, like I said, I was surprised how short this fucking film was. I did. I have to I think there were quite a few deleted scenes on the cutting room floor. Jack Craven, uh, that's a guy who knows a lot about. It. If you know a lot about deleted scenes, feel free to comment down below if you do see this. Uh, Sprite. See, I knew the fuck... I remember... I've been on a plane not too m much in my life. Uh, probably a total... And when I say times, I'm, I, I'm not counting like when you have to connect to a flight. To me, the whole thing is one time. Probably three times in my life. One, I was a kid and too young to remember... I think we went to Disney World. It was the Disney World. The second was went to New York, and not actual New York, but like a side of New York to visit some relatives. I remember they just had Sprite, so I just drink Sprite, Sprite, Sprite. And after it, I just got tired of Sprite. Like I don't want to drink Sprite again. I don't hate Sprite, but it's like I. It's like I got I, I drank so much Sprite. It was like my blood became Sprite, and then the, the so the Sprite thing made me remember that. But yeah, I was talking before about stonework. This is pretty damn good stonework. Obviously, with some of the bits with Jim Terry, you have to fake certain stuff. Like this is probably like a car underneath, the just from the camera. 
hiding the, the vehicle beneath. But the wide shots, like there's a wide shot where Jim Terry's character is going under the plane. That's some good stunt work. Again, it's not just that, like that bit there. That's some pretty, those wide shots, I'm sure is a stunt person with Jim Terry's clothes. I mean, you're still next to a, a real fucking plane. I mean, that's still not, I mean, it's not like planes are slow. <laughs> and Terry Ellis has like this hurt puppy dog feel to it. Like I say, he's not a bad guy. But yeah, this bit coming up where the Jim Terry idea, that's a pretty damn decent stunt work. Again, I keep harping on that because, deservedly so, we always talk about action films and stunt work. But comedies have some damn good ones too. Like, this is a pretty decent stunt coming up. I don't know who did this specific stunt, but you know, it's, not, it's just not something anyone really takes note when they talk, talk about Liar Liar. And that's this bit coming These what? Like, look at this. Oh, I always like that, like, oh shit. But that right there, like, that's crazy. You're going under a wing. You're, I guess, driving this thing. Which is, uh, I guess it makes sense to be able to drive like that. I don't know why I didn't think otherwise, but. I just, for some reason, I thought, since they're next to the airport, they get rolled out. But, okay, would they be able to drive so fast they would keep up with an airplane? Anyone who works at an airport, let me know. Of course, that's with wire work, flying. But those mobile stairways, anyone who works at an airport, let me know. Can they drive that fast? Or drive in that way? Or is that propped up for a movie? And I didn't notice this my first couple viewings. When Jim Terry's on the stretcher, when it comes back to the other characters, look in the background, Jim Terry's there as Fire Marshal Bill from In Living Color. I did not know that for a while. It's... They'll show Jim Terry, like Jim Terry's here, it will go back to the rest of the family. Look in the back, you see the guy with sunglasses, he's on a walkie-talkie, he's got a fireman hat, He's kind of talking like this. He's kind of got his teeth out. Right in the back there, that's Fire Marshal Bill. And I went, wow. So I guess it was just one of those goofball things. Hey, let me just go back here and I'll wear these sunglasses. It'd be Fire, Mar Fire Marshal Bill. It's kind of, okay, if you look at the screen, kind of all the way in the back, like over here. In the back. Got like sunglasses, got a walkie-talkie. Like, I can almost hear, let me tell you something. <laughs> now, Grant, I'm sure Jim Terry's Terry's going to go to jail even more so, because you can't do that shit nowadays. With terrorism and all that. I mean, after 2001, you couldn't do that. But you couldn't do this no matter what, but even more so. On a side note, when I got on an airplane a year or two ago, <clears throat> no, it was about a, over a year ago now, it was as bad as I thought it would be. Like, security wasn't too bad, there was not a lot of lines, uh, it wasn't that bad. The price wasn't as bad as I thought, maybe because of the circumstances, but yeah, it wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. I built all this horror up. Oh, the plane. I've been on a plane in years and years. How is it? And it's like, wow, this is actually fairly smooth. So, kind of nice and the surprising. And quick. I don't know what this kid has done since then. Let me try to see if I can look that up. Because I am curious. Hmm. 
Ideally, he's not a nice guy. He doesn't make a stink about it. Justin Cooper's Max. Justin Cooper use that is the menace strikes again in 1998 brothers keeper TV series the last of the year it was a sitcom episode of the practice episode of all about us I guess in 2003 he retired Oh, he works as the executive producer for the Ben Mahler show on Fox Sports Radio. Huh. Exec producer on a Fox Sports Radio show. Okay. Went to a different field. I did it uh, 10, 15 minutes ago. They did mention that Jim Terry may start his own law firm. Law firm, not firm. Law firm. So maybe he did do that. <laughs> and it's been a year and they kissed and... Kind of a symbol of maybe things will get better. Which is nice. It's sweet. Sweet bit of ending. I mean, this music, again, it's not so, so terrible, but it's not that I would ever listen to on my own. It just, I guess it works for what it needs to do, but... I guess, like, they they realized that the movie was so short with the cut, they decided to put these outtakes in there. Because I think this is the only Jim Carrey film that has outtakes. So it was interesting that they did... Well, I mean, that, that's probably why they did it. Because the film is so short. And the movie... A movie goes to the theater, it has to be a certain length. They don't... They kind of won't let you put a film out if it's too short. I mean, yes, there are exceptions, but... And this just shows a bit of his ad-libbing tapes. And maybe sometimes he did this for the crew, or sometimes he forgot his line. <laughs> and some of these artists are actually pretty funny as well it's kind of too bad that Jim Terry's films didn't do a lot more of this outtake stuff at the end did you see this and then you just see how such a variety of improv moments that is showcased in each of these scenes. One of the stuff in his other films were kind of cut out or not ever seen the light of day. Here's the overreactor. <laughs> He put me up to it. The director put him up to it. And there you go. I mean, that's liar, liar. I, even with all that, we have three minutes left, so it's an hour and 26 minutes with the end, Chris. Look, I mean, that's just boom, in and out. Doesn't overstay its welcome. Just, again, I don't know why, but just surprised just how short this film was. I had not seen it 
in a long while. I probably had not seen it for at least at least five years, maybe at least five years, at least. But it still holds up. It's still very funny. It's still very entertaining. Still got a lot of good laughs out of it. And Jim Carrey is easily the MVP of the movie. He made the film. He made the film a big hit. Uh, it's not a film that many people talk about nowadays. Now that I think about it. No one ever brings up Liar Liar when they talk about Jim Carrey. You know, they bring up The Mask, Ace Ventura, Dumb and Dumber. But this kind of gets left on the wayside. I mean, I guess it did. I think there's a Blu-ray, maybe from Shout Select, that came out recently, or is coming out, but I don't know if there's really any much new features on it. That'd be nice if, you know, Jim Carrey talked about it, but he only did that for the cable guy. But, yeah, solid film, fun film, fun comedy. I say well, I would put my top five favorite Jim Terry films and still entertaining. So, with that said, thanks for watching. Take care, and we will see you guys later.